tell us, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Take heed that no man deceive you, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences. All these are the beginning of sorrows. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. In the name of Jesus, uh, Lord God, we thank you for uh, that you told us to watch and pray. Be alert and pray. And as we watch and pray, Lord, we thank you that these events, uh, Lord, are not going to catch us unaware. We know, Lord God, we draw near to the day of the Lord. We draw near to your coming. And through these things, Lord God, we pray that you would make us more bold, you would make us more wise unto salvation, you would make us more willing to be a witness for you in these days, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to count the cost, what it means to follow you, and to take these words seriously, and to walk with you more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in regards to prophecy update, there's lots of things that are not considered prophecy, but a lot of people put it up on the news, you know, sort of a news update. It's not really a prophecy update, but really a news update. But this in particular one was really interesting to me. While prophetic events are actually happening in our world, literally, you can go to the scriptures and find these out, a whole generation of Americans, a whole generation of young people, this is... This is the sad part, and, and I don't even know how to say this, but are into so much of society, into social media, are into promoting themselves and promoting challenges and, and silly things. But this one is, is by far a bizarre one. Um, kids that are bored, and, and you know, they, they've done challenges from eating cinnamon to um, you know, eating the hottest chips and film themselves. While prophetic events are happening, Americans are cut up watching youth, kids, snorting condoms into their, into their noses and getting it out of their mouth. And uh, as sick as that is, it's becoming very popular, and kids are actually doing this consistently and, and getting more views. And of course, it's likes and reviews. And Yet, our Democratic Party wants our youth to be able to vote the next election because they want to lower the aging, uh, the vote, the age vote to uh, roughly about 16, 17. Um, so these are the, the youth that will be voting in, uh, whether for good or for bad, the next president of the course of the nation. And of course, they're being manipulated by the media, manipulated by our political structure to hate guns, <laughs> to hate the First Amendment, to hate free speech, to hate all those things, and to and to just love marijuana, love you know, free sex, love drugs, and hate God. That's the one thing that all these kids have, uh, have been brainwashed into our, into our um, school systems into thinking that that is being progressive, that's being right, that's being edgy, that's being cool. And even, the, even YouTube this week, which is at the, at the forefront of slamming free speech, an employee, um, um, employees, I should say, that... that find themselves censoring everyone that speaks about God, has conservative views. Uh, this week, uh, a woman went into San Bruno, California, and basically shot up the place. I believe she killed four individuals. And she was not the typical type uh, that you would think of owning a gun. She was a, a left-wing, highly liberal vegan who basically spoke out against... Uh, conservatives in many cases, but most of her videos are, are in line with diet and things like that. This is the kind of world in which we live in. Censoring free speech, YouTube uh, places being shut up, people snorting condoms, Tide Pods, you ever seen those Tide Pods? That's a big thing that happened with kids. They were swallowing it. On and on it goes. This is just to understand the, the society in which we live, the thinking and the society and where we are absolutely devoid of any understanding, let alone biblical understanding. And yet we have to understand the society. We have to understand the background and where we 
live and where we preach and who we preach to and how much prayer and boldness each individual one of us as Christians ought to have in, in the face of trying to reach a generation that is lost. We're all responsible for reaching our generation. Every generation, and biblically speaking, was responsible to teach the next generation, but to also to reach their generation. Well, we have a generation that is devoid of the Lord, devoid of any understanding, let alone of any... Uh, it used to be that people would have at least a biblical background. This generation has no biblical background, and yet these are the place, this is the place in which we find ourselves. And I don't get discouraged, I just go, there's a need. There's a tremendous need. There's a vacuum of um, true Christianity in America. And true Christianity can only come from true Christians. You're never going to have this emergent church, this seeker-sensitive model of churches being able to fulfill that which society needs. It'll never do it because it's not real Christianity. Real Christianity is take up your cross, follow him, count the cost, share Jesus, live. Live the message, defend the message, and preach the message, and without living it or defending it, there's no way people are going to be able to hear it. So besides that, let's get into prophetic events. This past week, Israel's been really challenging Iran. They flew into their airspace thanks to the Saudi Arabians, which we'll get to that at the end. The Saudis have become very open to Israel all of a sudden, defending their rights to the land, defending their rights to be there. And it's so unlike anything you've ever heard from imams or Muslims, uh, Orthodox Islam, that it's become real frightening, even to the point where uh, Israelis will take it, of course. They, they'll take the airspace and they flew into Iran just to show them that they could do it. And this is a message to Iran that Israel is very serious about the next upcoming war. We know there'll be a war because the Bible says there'll be a war. I don't have to speculate it. I just don't know when. But we do know that there's a demonic presence over Iran. Daniel tells us, Daniel 10, there's a prince of, the, of, of, of Persia that is in control of that area, has been so since Daniel chapter 10 tells us it'll come. It'll be in the last days. There'll be this incredible attack on Israel. And part of that is the prince of Persia, a demonic being, a principality, better said, that will come into that area. And since 1979, Iran has been vehemently anti-Israel, demonically anti-Israel, to the point where they're willing to nuke the whole Middle East in order to eradicate Israel off the face of the earth. This is the words of former president, the current president, and it continues. Now, the Palestinian March of Return. We have our, what was our march called? For guns, uh, peace, whatever, throw away the guns by the youth, manipulated by the media, of course. Um, the Palestinians in Gaza have their own march. And this is a fresh protest that begun because Israel killed terrorists in Gaza. And because there's war, there's always victims. That, 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 is, that is the collateral damage that happens in war. Um, obviously, never approve of anybody being killed, but the fact that now Gaza's turned into an attack on Israel, threatening uh, Israel to coming into that border. And if you ever see a map of Gaza, there's Gaza right there. It's on the Mediterranean coast. This is where the ancient Philistines used to live. This is the area. They, have five, they had five cities, and one of them was Gaza. This is where the road for Philip in the book of Acts, we're told that Philip walked down that road to, all, to take that chariot where the Ethiopian eunuch was riding back to Ethiopia. It's a very, very biblical area. Well, this is where the Gaza uh, protest is going on. Now, Gaza's been notorious. This has been going on for years, since 2006, shooting rockets from Gaza into Tel Aviv. It's not too far from there, within miles. And, of course, Jewish kids get killed. Children in Gaza gets killed. It's always a, it's always a terrible thing. Those innocent ones always pay the price. But terrorists have ruled that land since 2006. In fact, the, their people in Gaza voted for Hamas. The place could be called Hamasistan. They wanted to change it to Hamas because Hamas is actually the ruling party in that area. Well, they're willing to burn. Willing, literally, this is the Gaza Strip. 
Uh, you can see how far Tel Aviv is. You can see where Jerusalem is. But they're willing to burn down the entire area for the sake of Israel not being there. So the whole Palestinian march is to show them that Palestinians are not going to back down and they're willing to take over Israel. So make no mistake about it. This is a, an indictment against the, uh, the leaders of, of Gaza because they have incited this hatred against the Jewish people. And uh, as Steve and I were talking about tires, they're literally burning tires, hold down the whole Gaza, Gaza Strip area or the border. And uh, it could easily break out into a major confrontation. This is where we have to watch biblically, because when Israel is sidelined and sidetracked by this, Iran looms over the border, the northern part and the southern part. Remember, Israel has enemies from the north, from the south, from the east. And as the escalation of, of hatred continues, Iran is really behind this, and um, Israel's going to be heading into war. Uh, I believe it's going to happen sooner rather than later. I don't have a time, but I know that the Bible speaks about this confrontation, whether it will be the Ezekiel 38, 39 scenario, whether it will just be a confrontation with the Iran only. Um, the UN has called this, has called an emergency meeting on Gaza as Arab around the world, Arabs around the world slam Israel, willing to go to war against Israel over this. And of course, we knew that Turkey has called an Islamic army to come against the Jewish people. All that to say is, turn to Zechariah chapter 12, uh, Zechariah chapter 12, please. Zechariah chapter 12. It's an important chapter because it describes events of the day of the Lord. Events of the day of the Lord. Remember Zechariah? all the way up to chapter 12, has different visions. There's several visions in the book of Zechariah. We just got through chapter 11. If you were to read through it, chapter 11, it's a vision, a prophecy of Jesus, the good shepherd and the antichrist, the bad shepherd, the wicked shepherd, and how Jesus as a good shepherd would be, would be struck, would be killed, and the sheep would actually be scattered, but the Lord would um, protect his people. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. The money will be bought, will used to buy a potter's field, on and on, prophecies about Jesus in Zechariah chapter 11. And then it switches, right? This is an important part of Zechariah. This is why many people have a hard time with Zechariah because the vision changes. We are now transported into the day of the Lord. We're now cast into a future time that hasn't even happened yet. And it says, the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now, who's the word of the Lord? Jesus, right? Jesus. This is Jesus' burden for Israel. Jesus is coming. But before he comes, there's a major attack on Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of a man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all peoples around when the siege is against Jerusalem and also against Judah. Believe me, the issue is not Gaza only. The issue is not going to be the Golan Heights only. The issue is always going to be Jerusalem, specifically the Temple Mount. Imagine a telescope, right, and you zoom in and zoom in, or a camera, and you zoom in, and you got all these things in Israel, and what comes to focus at the last, at the end? Temple Mount. It's about the Temple Mount. It's about Jerusalem. And Zechariah sees this as a burden of the word of the Lord. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will gather it against it. When we study Zephaniah today, Zephaniah will tell us about God's dealings with the nations. The nations. And you see here, Events of the day of the Lord happen when the nations gather against Jerusalem. They circle it. But you say it's happened before. How do we know this is not the end? Uh, how do we know this is the end? Remember, Babylon surrounded it. Rome surrounded Jerusalem. Jesus prophesied that they will embank Jerusalem on every side and tip her over, knock her down, and there will be one, not one stone will be left upon another. But then it happens at the end. Right? That's biblical patterns of prophecy. 
happens once, happens again. These are shadows and types of the future. And the future one is at the end of the age. We'll see why. In that day, that's a clear indication. Circle it, highlight it. Whenever the prophets speak of in that day, we, we, did, it, we did a study a couple weeks ago on the day of the Lord and how the prophets use the word in that day. In that day, they look close and they look far. They look to their own time, what was happening, and then they look ahead at the day of the Lord, at the day of, the, at the day of Christ when he comes. I will strike every horse with bewilderment and riders and madness. I will watch over the house of Judah. I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Madness and blindness is really what the judgment of God's going to be against those who come against his people. Madness and blindness. And you see Islam today, how it has brought madness and blindness to the people all around Israel. They don't even know why they hate them. They just, they just hate them. There's an eternal hatred, a perpetual hatred that has come within the heart of Islam for the, uh, for the Jewish people. Ezekiel says that those who live in that area, the area of Mount Seir, Jordan, have a perpetual hatred against Jacob. Esau's hatred is replayed in the hatred of the descendants of Ishmael, the descendants of, uh, of the children of Abraham, the other children of Abraham, that come against Isaac's, Jacob's children, the Israelis, the Jewish people. And Israel's continue to be that way until Jesus comes. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the, through the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot amongst uh, pieces of wood and flaming torch among the sheaves. God is going to make the Jewish people fight back against, uh, against this attack. There will be an attack against Jerusalem, and they will come, and they will fight back against the people, but it will be overwhelming. It says in verse 7, The Lord also will save the tents of Judah, first in order in the, that the glory of the house of God and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not be magnified above Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why? You have to keep reading. Chapter 13 and chapter 14 continue, especially chapter 13. Jerusalem gets invaded. Jerusalem will be overcome. Jerusalem will be cut in half. People will go out. Two-thirds of the Jews will die. The houses will be destroyed. People will be exiled. Women will be ravished. It, it gives you this cataclysmic picture that it's all lost. And it's like snapshots in the, in the middle of a... We don't have those, those machines anymore. People don't even know what those are. But remember when you used to go on vacation, you take pictures and you put them on your slideshow? And you invite your friends over and you show them the pictures when you're at SeaWorld. You never did that? Okay. Um, you still do that. All right, never mind. You still do that? All right. My kids have no idea what that means. And, um, but they're slideshows, right? Sometimes they're not in order. You're just like, oh, wait a minute. That was before we got there. No, no, that was after we got there. No, 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 we got the airport out there. I said, well, no, we're now back at the hotel. And sometimes you put them out of order and it becomes like this puzzle you have to put together. Imagine... Is Zechariah being exactly the same way. It gives you snapshots. It gives you pictures. It gives you not necessarily an order. When you read it together, then you go, oh, this happens first, and this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, because then verse 10 says, I will pour out my house of, on the house of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications that they will look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over the firstborn in the day. They'll see Jesus. When all is lost, when all seems hopeless, if the city is ravished, destroyed, half the people gone, murdered, city is divided, then the remnant cry out to the Lord because God poured his spirit upon them, and they will see Jesus coming. And that will begin the restoration. It says in verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, in that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. And it will come about in that day that the, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols of the land and they will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. God's going to get rid of all these things that have come against Jerusalem. False prophets, idolatry, immorality, 
cleansing will happen to the Jewish people. They will be born again, we would say, by the Spirit because he come, the Spirit comes down and they see Jesus. What happened to us? The Spirit came down upon us and we saw Jesus. We believed in him and the Spirit was outpoured for salvation. They'll have that experience, but it happens at the end. The, the remnant will see Jesus. The Jewish remnant will see Jesus at the end. These are the calamities of the day of the Lord. But the goal of the Palestinian is to destroy Israel. The Palestinian march, this idea of the Palestinian march, the march of return, they call it. The march of return is to destroy Israel. And you know what God says, I will fight against the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's, that's God saying. And not just God, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus says it. The word of the Lord. Remember Logos? Jesus is the Logos, John 1, 1. It's the Logos of God says, this is what God has prepared for his people. He's not going to let it happen. The ultimate destruction of Israel will not happen because God has a promise to Israel through Abraham, through the patriarchs. But Islam is trying. And is Islam has a, a fight against God. It's a fight against Israel, but it's ultimately against God. Saudi Arabia, uh, and this is a really good article. If anybody wants to read it, I, I recommend it. If you want to understand how Saudi Arabia has turned its face from being pro, hardcore pro-Islamic fundamentalist to a more soft version of Islam. And the Saudi Arabia has to face a, has to face Turkey and has to face Iran because Iran and Turkey are the hardliners. They're the hardliners. Saudi Arabia has turned more soft toward Israel in a, in a sense of their stance against uh, the Jewish people. So in an unpredictable Middle East, Saudi Arabia has said, you know what, um, we're not going to come against Israel. We're going to partner with Israel because our real enemy is Iran. And the Iran is with Turkey. So you have this, this sort of a triangle that's going on with Russia, Turkey, Iran coming together. And then on the other side, you have Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and Israel. How is this going to turn out? I don't know. But the epicenter seems to be right now Syria, Damascus, which will alert you in your mind to say, where have I read that in the Bible? Isaiah saw a vision. A vision that it's not very nice to think about. But he saw a vision that Damascus will no longer exist. Now, Damascus has been around for a long time, one of the oldest ancient cities in the world. Still inhabited today. Paul the Apostle went there, right? Uh, he was on his way to destroy Christianity on the road to Damascus. We'll read in chapter, uh, Acts chapter 9. But now the fight is going to turn into Islam against Islam, right? Esau's brother against Esau's brother. We're told that in the prophecy in Genesis that their sword, that the sword of Esau, will be against his brother. There will always be this contention in Islam. It is actually fighting against Islam. So they're Sunni against Shiites, and Iran doesn't like Turkey, but they, have to go, they come together because of the hatred for the Jewish people. But here is the dictator of Turkey, Erdogan, who is urging, he's, he's basically calling out Netanyahu and say, saying that he's a terrorist and going up against this idea that the Jewish people need to get out of the land. And he just signed this, uh, this deal with, um, with Russia uh, to move uh, the delivery dates of these S-400. I didn't have a picture. I should have brought a picture of these S-400 um, military weapons. These are tanks that could shoot missiles from, uh, they're formidable formidable um, weapons and uh, to move up the delivery date and uh, they agreed this is Putin the uh, prime minister or the president of Russia or the dictator of Russia if you want to call him that with the dictator of Turkey why would Turkey need so many weapons why would they need so many weapons because they're gearing for war and in your news and your updates and when you read and you pray and you seek the Lord just watch out for those things that come up Turkey Iran Saudis, Israel. You're seeing it all over the news. Uh, why? Because the, the world's getting ready for something that the Bible speaks so much in advance. And it's interesting, Saudi Arabia, the prince, Prince bin Salim, um, he has come out, and um, this, is, this is quite interesting. He has just come out and said that the Jewish people, 
Jewish people, um, have a right to its own land. Now, this is the prince that maybe a few months ago, maybe longer than that, maybe about, uh, within the last six months, Saudi Arabia went through this whole upheaval. They, they, they had princesses where this is the house of Saud. Remember, in Saudi Arabia, the name, it doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. They were basically a British mandate. The name comes from a British mandate. After World War I and World War II, they basically carved up the Middle East. We're going to call this area this. We're going to call this area that. The Bible doesn't call it Saudi Arabia. You won't, call, you won't find that name in the Bible. The Bible calls them by the ancient names, right? Dedan, the tents of Midian, right? These are the descendants of Ishmael. These are the Saudi Arabia. These are Arabs, right? They're Arabs. They're not Persians. Big, big difference, right? Even in the Middle East, they don't like to be called Iranians. They like to be called Persians, right? Saudi Arabia, Persia, they're not the same people. They're not Arabs. Only the Saudis are. Persia is, um, they, they're not even Arabs. They're, they come from actually Europeans. Right? They were called Iranians because Hitler um, had this whole Aryan idea. You ever heard of the Aryan idea of, of Hitler? Anybody? Okay. They're the supreme race. Aryan nation, okay, okay. The Iranian, or the Persians saw that, and they, they, they emulated this idea of the perfect race, and, and Hitler looked up to the old Persians being the, the most sophisticated race, and they had a, a pure race, and so he, he, he thought of them as the true Aryans, so it was called Iran. The Iranians, the Aryans, right? They were originally blue, uh, blue eyes and blonde hair. They, they weren't really necessarily <laughs> Arab looking, there was so much, so much commingling now. Iranians look more Middle Eastern, but that's the whole, that's the whole part of it. Anyway, Sheba, Dedan, the tents of Midian. That's what the Bible calls Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has come out and said, you know, not only we're going to respect the fact that Israel has the land or should be in the land, but we're also going to give them airspace, right? So Prince uh, bin Salman, sorry, bin Salman has come out and said, I'm the new prince. I'm the head of Saudis. We're going to work with the Jewish people. We're going to work with them. And he's recently met with uh, uh, um, even people in our, in our uh, uh, cabinet, and the um, U- uh, U.S. cabinet, not only with President Trump, but Jared Kushner, to uh, really promise the Jewish people that they're going to be behind them. They already started working with them against Iran and against Turkey. Now, like anybody, you would be suspicious. Are they really trying to do this? Are they really trying to work with the Jewish people? Or is this a bait and switch idea where they would ingratiate themselves with Israel and then turn its back on Israel at the end? Well, Prince Mohammed bin Salman is saying, no, this is real. And actually, uh, I read a really interesting thing, uh, um, an article that came out, and you should read it as well, because not only did he is dealing with the political aspect of it, he's also dealing with the religious aspect of it. He met with Catholics, he met with Jews, and some Christians, some evangelical Christians, in a meeting about interfaith dialogue. He's very big on interfaith dialogue. And he's come out and said, well, in order for us to work together, we need to work unity. You know, all the buzzwords. Think of a social justice warrior. All the, buzz, all the buzzwords. Unity, uh, respect, tolerance, and uh, he met with Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, conservative Catholics, and they said, we need to work together because, you know, he basically gave the story. Look, Saudi Arabia was, for a long time, very anti-Israel, very anti-Semitic, and that was the old guard. And about six months ago, Saudi Arabia had this whole upheaval. The, 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 the former king, or the former prince, basically gave the throne to, this, to, to his son, instead of going through this whole aspect of the next person was going to be the cousin of the king, who was much more, uh, much more anti-Israel, but has more experience. He was the one that was going to be next in the, in the line of kings. And they gave it to his son, which was unprecedented. And there was a removal of a lot of people in Saudi Arabia. There was a, a basically, not necessarily a coup d'etat, but a cleansing of the whole area of the government of, of uh, Saudi Arabia. And he ended up being the prince, ended up being the, uh, the, the, the ruler of Saudi Arabia. Now, not only for Israel, but promoting interfaith dialogue. 
He wants to remake the Middle East, and this is uh, the title of that article, Remaking the Middle East. He is, uh, they have a lot of money because of petrol oil, but they also know that they can only exist, they can only exist based on oil. There's nothing. Saudi Arabia has nothing. There's really nothing except for oil money. And they understand that now. And so now they're changing their tunes instead of fighting against Israel and the U.S. They want to become our allies. We gave them billions of dollars on weapons, uh, access to uh, uh, nuclear capabilities, access to information, type of NSA, NASA, uh, not NSA, information. All that was given to them when Trump went over to Saudi Arabia not too long ago. So watch for these events in the Middle East. How is Israel getting caught up in this? Is this the beginning of the betrayal of Israel, where Israel is so desperate for peace, they would do anything and sign with anybody and be protected by anybody that can be able to, 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 to protect them? We don't know, ultimately, speculations, but God in his word has told us that Israel, because of the rejection of the Messiah, is blinded. A partial blindness has come upon them. Partial meaning because of some Jews have come to believe in Jesus. But for the most part, the nation has rejected him. And they're blinded to the fact that they have a destiny with God. And they're blinded to the fact that they can't keep the Torah. They can't keep the law of Moses. They can't keep it. What makes all these uh, uh, so-called Christian Hebrew roots people trying to keep it? <laughs> I don't understand it, but they can't keep it. Nobody can keep it. It was meant to point you to Christ, and it was meant to show you your sin. It was meant to bring you righteousness. Now, people were to be righteous. They were to try to keep the law and be righteous in the Old Testament. It wasn't, well, we can't keep it anyway, so what the, it doesn't matter. It was to, be, it's to keep them like a tutor until the Messiah would come. That's what the law was for. Saudi Arabia, watch out for them. We're told in Ezekiel, for some reason or another, they stand on the sidelines while the invasion happens. I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what it means. I don't know how that's going to work out. But we're told that in the book of Ezekiel. They take a passive approach at the invasion of Israel. Because an invasion will occur. 38, 39 of Ezekiel tells us that. Study it, read it, but we're told that they take a sort of a backseat approach. Now, switching gears to persecution of Christianity in China, again, continues to be on the rise because their new... Uh, form of, what do we call it, a revolution in the way they deal with religions is how, what they call it. It's, it's basically a social change of the government and how they deal with religion. And because of that, they have a lot of crackdowns on Christian churches. Every week I brought you a, a, an article of some sort about China. and We're concerned because we have brothers and sisters, dear brothers and sisters, even personally that we know, that um, this could affect. But this particular case, China is cracking down on Christianity. Nothing new, I guess you would say, but it's getting worse because of their biometric system, the technology, the uh, uh, upgrade in technology that can, social media, facial recognition, has become terrible for Christians in China. But now we're being told that um, this is nothing new. But just the mention of it should bring you back memories of re-education camps. Mao had them before the Chinese, during the Chinese Revolution. We'll send Christians to camps. Russia had, had these uh, uh, gulags. Have you about the gulags? Ever heard of the term gulag? Gulags were like this prison camp where they re-educate you to be right with the government. So if you were against the government, you know, they wouldn't kill you per se, but they will send you to these gulags, these re-education camp where you will learn how to be a better citizen through hard work and labor and, and, and uh, torture. Um, remember, you ever watched the movie uh, Torture for Christ? Okay, uh, what happened to Richard Warmbrandt? He went to prison, actually, but Romania, just like Russia, had these, these camps, these uh, re-education camps. Christians are being sent there, not only Christians, but also other ethnic minorities. Now, China's been well known for this for quite some time, and maybe it's news to you, but uh, if it is surprising to you, um, you know, just understand that China has done this for quite a long time. If you're an enemy of the state, they don't ask you questions. They'll just come pick you up at your house, get you in a black van, and um, if your family ever sees you again, then that's good, because um, most of them don't. 
ever see them again. Well, that type of tyranny, that type of um, um, control is happening in, uh, in China today, where Christians uh, um, are being basically violated their human rights, but also other minorities, not just Christians, but other ethnic minorities. So China, it is encompassing other minorities as well as Christians, even though they may not be of other minorities. However, uh, what's interesting, too, is that they, they, pulled, um, they pulled Bibles from online stores. You can't buy Bibles online stores in China at this moment. So um, bookstores uh, have to comply with the values of socialism. That's what this new reformation is called by the state, the values of socialism. So the Bible doesn't quite fit their paradigm of what they want. So they can't, um, you can't buy Bibles online. Um, Christians basically pull, uh, are outraged about this. And, uh, um, well, if they're, if they're going to protest, China has gathered what they call voice prints. And this is something that the NSA does already in our country, in our nation. China does this as well. They identify people by, based on their voice and their pitch. and their, Everybody has a different, um, uh, basically a voice print, what they call it. So you and I... When we talk, it's a different voice print able to tell you who you are by your voice. Well, China is able to gather that information very, very quickly. So if you speak against the government, they could come pay you a visit. Remember, they had the whole facial recognition thing, too. You know, if, uh, in China, there's not a whole lot of protest because if you protest, the police, was, they don't even deal with you. They just film you. They film the whole thing. And then they run, they run it through their database, facial recognition. They know that's Pierre or me or whatever. And they'll just come to your door because you're protesting against the government. That's not allowed. That's not tolerated. And, of course, the president of China, Xi Jinping, is, of course, gathering more power and becomes like a dictator. You have a dictator in Russia. You have a dictator in China. You have a dictator in Turkey. You have a dictator in Iran. All these, what the Bible call an antichrist, right? Antichrist, these figures, these totalitarian figures who claim some type of deity or some type of descent, uh, being descendant of a, a deity, sort of like King Yam-un from North Korea. Now, Christians are under attack also in India. This past week, 11 different attacks so far this year, but more happened during this uh, celebration uh, of the resurrection of Jesus. India suffered a week of horror, a week of horror uh, on Palm Sunday, especially when extremists, now, remember, we've been talking about India. A few years ago, India suffered a change in the way the government was, was set up. And what, what meant that is more nationalist governments and candidates came into the, into the picture. And the new prime minister of India is very national, meaning that it's pro-India. So if it's pro-India, it's pro-Hindu. And if it's pro-Hindu, you can't have other religions in India. And so he's very anti-Christian. Now, India has... Grow, uh, the, the, the growth of Christianity in India is explosive. It's amazing. It, the amount of people that are in India, and to claim about 8 to 10% Christian, it's quite a bit of people. Uh, by the rate that they're growing, they could pass China as the most amount of Christians in the world at the rate that they're growing by 2050, unless the Lord doesn't come. Uh, but they would have more Christians in India than in China. It's explosive. But India, the police... And the Hindu extremists are ramping up their, their attacks. Constant villages and churches being burnt down, pastors being beaten, taken, uh, taken out uh, from their home at night, just randomly beaten uh, for the name of the Lord. Now, in Iraq, Christians have, have they've basically almost been exterminated. About 80% of Christians in Iraq have disappeared, whether they moved or they were killed or they're in prison. And they list, I have a list of the six most persecuted places in the world today and, and not just persecuted, where Christians can't practice their faith, meaning that there is a resistance, whether it's violent or whether it's just basically censorship by the government. That is China, Venezuela, which is quite, quite interesting there, but that's been going on since he, uh, Hugo Chavez was there. Uh, he was no friend of Christians, really. He was an antichrist for sure, probably demonically possessed. India, Nigeria, Sudan, and Indonesia. Six places in the world where Christians are losing their religious freedoms more and more. And this is uh, from Nigeria as well. And Boko Haram, which is a, a Muslim terrorist group, refused to release 15-year-old Christian girl that was kidnapped 
uh, along with 110 other schoolgirls, because they refused to convert to Islam. Because they refused to convert to Islam. So these girls have more uh, courage than most pastors that I know. They won't give in to Islam. They're not refusing their faith. They could be killed. They could be raped. And maybe they, some of them have already. But they will not be released because they, they refuse to defame Christ. And so parents are crying and weeping and asking other Christians to pray uh, because they don't want, their, of course, their children to die, but they also don't want their children to denounce the name of the Lord. Um, one of the parents was quoted, I am very sad, but I'm also overjoyed because my daughter did not denounce Christ. Um, you see the difference in faith and Christianity in the West? Well, and, and then here, you know, we probably would have sent out a bunch of hashtags, release the girls or something like that, and, you know, and, you know candle, vigil candles, and just release them and things like that. And, uh, over there, they're saying, I just don't want them to denounce Christ. I don't want them to denounce Christ. And you don't hear so much in the West. And, of course, um, um, you know, constantly uh, states and governments in, in, our, in our United States are constantly pushing Islam into, the, into the society, into the school systems. That's the real Islam. You know, and, and governments and states, especially California, especially other liberal states that push the agenda of Islam uh, down society, they really have no idea what they're dealing with. Um, this, pro uh, this happened in particular, NBC, uh, this, is, this is the attack on Christianity in the West, nothing like the Middle East. But this is what happened in the West. The NBC basically said Christianity's help... Uh, it's, it's the only use Christianity has is to help promote the KKK and white supremacy. Uh, you know, the way they look at Christianity, this is liberal left, this is NBC. You might as well say, you know, a Russian newspaper or something like that. This is just so extremist, Marxist, crazy, liberal, uh, beyond belief, that would actually side with Islam and against Christians. Well, they're calling Christianity a way for white supremacy to increase. Now, just to give you an idea, in Connecticut, Churches are being converted to mosques. This is a church in Connecticut. Uh, congregation is a United, United Congregational Church uh, from the 1920s, and Connecticut is being sold into it being sold to Muslim groups. Same thing happened in Pennsylvania. Same thing is happening in other parts of the states, where Christian churches are just closing up and selling them to Muslim groups, and they're finding that um, you know Christian churches is better off as a, as a community center. They'll just open up a community center for all people to come. Uh, and then Muslims take over, and they become, uh, in the community, it becomes a mosque, or it becomes a Muslim community center as well. Now, this, is, this happened a couple of weeks ago, the Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good. This was a, a, done in Washington. Hundreds of Jewish, Muslims, and Christian faith leaders united together as the Abrahamic faith, all three faiths from Abraham, Muslim, Christians, and Jews, gathered together, uh, to speak on the, um, you know, a common good. We all have a common good. Islam has a common good with Christianity. Christianity has a common good with Islam. And, and uh, Islam has a common good with Judaism. And they all gather there to promote uh, unity, to promote change, to promote the common good. And uh, the presence of so many evangelicals, um, which they say, which normally has a negative view of Islam, uh, people were very excited because there were a lot of evangelical Christians there uh, that provided a welcome backdrop for uh, and aimed at championing tolerance. Championing tolerance. So all those Christian pastors that were there, evangelical pastors, who basically uh, sold Jesus down the river to commune with Muslims and Jews who reject the deity the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the common good. A time is coming, and it's already here, that the idea of good will be detached from God. That's what the word good comes from. It comes from God. And it will be championed. It will be uh, branded as this is what you need to do. You need to be doing something good but without God. Do something good without God. Beware of the new good. Beware of the new good when somebody can be good without God. You can have tolerance and justice and mercy and kindness without God. 
which is impossible. However, they're going to make it work. They're going to make it work. And there's lots of Christian churches that have sold to this idea. But the whole purpose of it is to be socially good, to do good. And, and, and now, the Bible does speak about that. Do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. Do good to all. Be in peace with all men. These are, these are clear teachings of Scripture. However, how do we do good to all? How do we good? How do we peace with all men? How to do good to all these people? It's because of the gospel. The gospel is what brings good social change through the gospel of Jesus, not through some tolerant idea where you just um, basically agree that Jesus is not God or agree that Jesus is not the, the Messiah. Uh, but this is coming. The new good is coming, and we will be judged as haters. We will be judged as uh, as, as bigots. We will be judged as People that don't want the good because we don't agree to sell the truth for just being good. Remember, it's not being good. Good without you know, goodness without God doesn't exist. Goodness without God it doesn't exist. And uh, so I'm going to switch gears real quick to this idea, and this is uh, 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 we're, right, we're quickly running out of time. But this happened in Australia. I talked to um, I talked to uh, David about this. This is the first exhibition in Australia where literally this artist wants to promote the idea that pigs and humans can blend together. Now, if you don't know, understand, this is, they've been doing this for quite a while. Okay? This is not new, but it's out in the open now. This was in the back rooms of, I don't know, some conspiracy theorists a long time ago. But the governments have been involved in gene splicing, human genome. The whole aspect of the human genome is to really grab the hold of um, everything about DNA, be able to mix and match, change things, and even get to our brains, even trying to manipulate our brains through chips and things like that. Anyway, that's a whole different story. But the mixing of, of, of um, species have been going on for quite some time. Uh, articles have come out. And I, I have some of the articles if you want to ever read them, if you don't believe it, you know, but just bear with it. This, this artist have come out and said, look, it's already a known fact. Let's celebrate it. Let's celebrate the fact that we can mix pigs and humans together. And these genetically modified human-pig hybrids. Now, this is just an exhibition. Of course, these are just figures that she made uh, to show how in the future we can actually have you know, this type of humanity, a new humanity. Uh, this is in Brisbane, which is about two hours when we're da where Davy lives. And uh, Mrs. Pacini, the, the artist, uh, says that she, these are extraordinary creatures. And this project has addressed the rapidly accelerating interactions and overlapping of conflicts of human and non-human world as it stands. I think it's a provocation about possible futures, some of which have already arrived. She says, Hey, be open to change. You know the whole trans, the whole gay movement, the whole transsexual movement, that, that was never the end. That was never the end result of it. People just got up in arms about it. And it's a sin. It's sexually sin. Aberrant, aberrant sexual practices, absolutely. But that's not the end game. The end game is to change humanity, to change the image of God in the face of the earth to something morbid, to something um, that is absolutely uh, grotesque, and it's not what God intended. Read Genesis 6. For more information on that, see how it happened before. The days of Noah would happen again, uh, Jesus said. Just like the days of Noah, where you had this incredible merging of, of spiritual demonic angels, demonic beings, interacting with humans and breeding a whole new set of humanity. Uh, they were called giants. They had all these different ideas. They were called Nephilim. Uh, I know some Christians don't agree with it. Don't, you know, don't, to read Genesis 6 is a totally different idea of the sons of Shem and things like that, but just on the basis of reading exegetically the text, you have to come to a conclusion. Something terribly happened in Genesis 6. Something so much so that God was angry at what happened and has locked up these angels that committed these sexual sins uh, under darkness in chains in, in the darkest parts of hell. That's what the book of Jude is about. So Jude talks about it. Genesis talks about it. Jesus said, just like the days of Noah. Not like the days of Noah, just like it. And the Greek is emphatic. It'll happen just the same way. So read Genesis 6, or what happened in Noah's days? The violence, the hatred against God, 
It'll be just like him. And then, of course, humanity changes. Now, I'm not saying there are pigs, with you know, that human hybrid pigs running around the world. Most of them don't make it past a certain gestation stage. They're not, they can't, legally, they can't keep them alive past a certain gestation. This is all information that you can gather on your own. Uh, but who's to say a government won't be able to recreate a human body uh, that won't have a spirit, but just basically a human body? And um, something worse can inhabit them. Something worse will inhabit them. And, um, and that's where a lot of this demonic activity is, will be taking place in the world. So we live in a very interesting and strange times where this is being celebrated. Now, an, uh, they, they want to promote this idea of hybrids and pigs, but they also want to destroy God's real image and likeness on the face of the earth. 19 Democratic attorneys. Uh, attorney general, sorry, 19 Democratic attorney generals want to force Christian doctors to do abortions. Force them. And if you don't like it, you can get out of practice, is what they said. Uh, you don't have to follow these laws if you don't like it. If you don't like to kill babies, you can just get out of medical practice. 19 Democratic attorney generals have said this. Uh, ethical rules should require pediatricians to medically inhibit normal puberty as demanded by parents to treat their child as gender dysphoria even if they're morally opposed to the concept of the, of the supposed treatment, the, actual is, the answer is yes. So Christians should not um, get in the way of a child having gender uh, dysphoria, and they should give them hormones to change them from a boy to a girl. Christians should not morally uh, go against this. That's what the, this democratic... Um, governors are trying to do. But furthermore, it goes further. It's now about babies. It's now about aborting babies. So if you oppose to it, then you need to either give way to another doctor or get out of medicine. So this medical conscious, medical conscious, which if, if you know a doctor, um, my brother is one. Uh, he's a PA. My sister-in-law is a PA as well. One of the first things that they do, the Hippocratic Oath, doctor do no harm. Right? Doctor, do no harm. They literally are telling doctors, you need to violate your oath by killing another human being. And, and or Yeah, exactly. And, 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 yeah, it's a, a gender dysphoria. Treat it with more hormones. Make a little boy be a little girl. Don't get in the way. Don't let your Christian values get in the way. If you do, you need to get out of medicine. And that's how they're forcing, really, Christian nurses, Christian doctors, um, have this conscience now that they have to really think about, am I fit to stay in this practice? Am I, you know, how much will I be able to take on my uh, Hippocratic Oath, or do I have to violate my conscience? So it, it's, it's continuing on in a, in, a, in a state and in a place where God is not welcome in an eternity war. And he's been kicked out of there a long time ago, so now we see the, the repercussions of it. Um, I'm going to switch gears because i got a couple more. Oh, we got to get to the video. Uh, Europe is turning against Christianity. We've known about that, but Sweden is at the forefront of it. Sweden is denying any free speech. Social media is being completely um, overrun uh, against Christianity, against conservative views. Anybody who speaks against the government, especially against um, the government allowing immigrants in, is being watched, is being searched, is being jailed. This is happening in Sweden. Christian Sweden at one point. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, because of the rape. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's the rape capital of the world now. It used to be South Africa, now it's Sweden. Uh, why? Because they invaded Islam. They kicked God out a long time ago because of socialism, and they replaced it with Marxism, and they replaced it with humanism. But that's never the end, isn't it? They have to, it, it always, a vacuum fills in, right? A vacuum is created, and what comes in is something worse, Islam. Now, uh, I want to get to this because this, this is the end part of our, of our prophecy update. Um, the coins I've been talking about, the coins uh, that the temple has come out, the Temple Institute has now uh, minted, I guess that's how you say it, minted. Uh, we talked about it a month ago that it was coming. Some people said it was Photoshopped and didn't believe me. I said, look, it's real. I know it's not out yet, but just watch it. Okay, it's here. Um, I'm not a prophet, no son of a prophet, but I knew it was coming out. Uh, they minted these coins in this commemoration of the Balfour Declaration, which was uh, England, 
but it also has Cyrus, the image of Cyrus the Persian, who helped, that's in the Bible, Second Chronicles, as well as the book of um, Daniel. Cyrus the Persian led Israel, or allowed Israel to go back into the land. This is in the time of Nehemiah. This is the time of the prophet Haggai. This is the time of uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and allowed them to build a second temple. Well, they minted a coin with his face and Trump's face on it because now the declaration that Trump had in 2017 about Jerusalem and Israel, the capital, this has uh, given them great joy that they will finally be able to rebuild the third temple, the third temple. So I'm not saying in any sort of way that Trump is the Antichrist of any of those sort of things. I, 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 I won't go in speculations. I know some people have speculated about Erdogan speculated about Putin and things like that. There's no basis of it. The Bible doesn't tell us who it is. We'll know through the Holy Spirit later on when the man of sin is revealed. But we do know one thing. This is setting up the stage for the Jews to build this and to embrace coins and, and markings of a leader that would allow them to build a temple. This is, I'm, this is biblical time. I'm president at times. This is, you're living in things that you read about before, but more. They're getting ready for Shavuot. They're getting ready for the Feast of Weeks. We don't call it Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost. As Christians, we know that the Word of God tells us that the Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost, the beginning of the church. Right? Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension brings forth the Holy Spirit is poured out as a gift from the Father to us, to all who believe. The Spirit is given and it's outpoured. Spirit is given and it's also outpoured in Pentecost. Feast of Weeks. It happened on the, on the day of the Feast of Weeks where the Jewish people, this is according to Levitical law, Deuteronomical law, they're to take the first fruits of the harvest and have to count the measurement of barley and they need to bring sacrifices to the Lord. It's called the grain offering. They're to bring the first fruits. That happened on Resurrection Weekend. They're bringing the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits from the, from the Resurrection. But the, the Jewish people still commemorate this, right? They still commemorate it, but now they're doing it in the land, in the temple area. Not only Passover, which was last week, but now they're getting ready for the Feast of, or the feast of Weeks. And biblically, they are to go onto the field. They're to harvest, right? This is the first harvest. This is the, 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 basically the first fruits of the harvest, what comes out of the ground, they're to take it and give thanks to the Lord, according to Leviticus. And they're to do this. They're to do this in the temple area, to bring it to Jerusalem. They're to do this with musical instruments. It's to sing to the Lord and thank the Lord. And they're to count the barley, count the omer, is what they call it, count the omer, for 49 days plus one. So it's 50 days. 50 penta. That's how you say it in Latin. Penta. We get the word Pentecost is what the Romans called it. And they're counting. This is literally doing this just like in biblical times. And uh, I have a video here because um, they, uh, they have the Kohenims, the, the priest. These are the priests. These are the descendants of the Kohens, or Kohenites. And the uh, Levitical law, we're told that the sons of Aaron were the line of the high priest, but the sons of Levi were to do this. And they had different functions, different roles. So for the last 60 years, the Jewish people have gathered DNA evidence and DNA testing of many Jews around the world. A lot of them came from Brooklyn. If you know anybody with the last name Cohen, that's last name Cohen, Cohenites. They were descendants of the Levites. They have a genetic trait. They have certain markings that lets them know that they're from this line. And so they've gathered them. They train them. They put them in vestments. They, put them, they, they go through this whole process. And now they're ready. They're practicing how to do the feast. And here's the... Shocking, I know. It's like. <laughs> הקשה בקרן הדרומית בערבית, שוב הצמדת, הכלי עם המנחה, במלואה בינתיים, אל קרן המזבח. וכעת, המיון 
של החלק שמוכתר לבין השיריים, וזאת הקמיצה, הכהן קומץ בידו את מנחת השעורים, רק מהחלק, ובשלב הזה צריך להיזהר לא לקחת מהלבונה. לא לקחת מהלבונה, בשלב זה... לכן מקפידים לשים את הלבונה בצד אחד. וכעת, הכהן ניר יעלה בכבש, ימלח את המנחה ויקטיר אותה. שימו לב, חלק מהעבודות כאן נעשו ביד ימין בלבד. הקפיצה בימין, לעומת זאת, החזקת הכלי בדרכו אל המזבח יכולה להיות... מליחה גם כן בימין, והנה ההכתרה גם כן ביד ימין, והם מרוקדים את פי השרת על... Okay. If I were to tell Roy's dad that the Jews had not been in the land for 2,000 years, but his son would see priest, Jewish priest, Kohenite, real Jewish priest, reenacting a temple sacrifice in Jerusalem, in the Temple Mount, he would have laughed. It was unthinkable. Nobody would have laughed. Israel wasn't even around. It was just swamp land. The Jews were all over. The, they wouldn't even want to come back to the land. 1948, 1967, now 2017, 18. They're getting ready to build a temple. They have the sacrifice. What he did, you can go, go to Leviticus and find the grain offering. All the offerings are pictures of Jesus. Jesus is the real grain offering. Put in the season with salt, right? Thrown into the fire. Jesus suffered, right? The suffering of Jesus. The grain offering is the suffering of Jesus, his body, right? But they're just doing, they're doing the sacrifices. The reenactment, at least. But they're doing it believing that they have to keep the Torah. They have to keep the temple sacrifices. The Levitical priest, the Levitical law, the temple, the, the, the law of Moses. But that's been fulfilled. The book of Hebrews tells us clear that Jesus is once and for all, the eternal, the perfect, the only sufficient sacrifice. And what the Jewish people are doing, according to the book of Hebrews, is crucifying, re-crucifying, or putting Jesus back on the cross. He's the Lord of glory. He's, they're reenacting his death over and over again uh, in vain. He doesn't die twice. He dies once. And he lives forevermore. But, of course, Judaism is anti-Christian. It's anti-New Testament. They don't see it. They don't understand that it's been fulfilled in Christ. So these, these sacrifices will be reenacted. They're being reenacted. But something more sinister is going to happen. They'll be reinstituted. There'll be a new covenant, a covenant made, not a new covenant. A covenant will be reinstated by the men of sin in the temple. You see all these kids. It's, it's real funny because these kids, these Jewish kids with the, you know, with the, with the, with the hair and the, and the kippahs and all the stuff. And they got iPhones and, and, it's, it's, and everybody's with the camera. I can imagine what it would be like when the whole world will be watching the temple being open and reinstituted and, the, and now the Levitical law is back into law of Moses coming back, which the Bible says it's been done in Jesus, but they're going to try to do it again because the man of sin will allow them to do it and he will betray them according to the book of Daniel, according to Paul, according to Jesus, and will set up the abomination of desolation in the temple that they want to build. It's already there. Honestly. How long would it take? I don't know. But it could happen very, very fast. All it takes is for them to go, yep, do it. And now, you're basically in countdown mode from the time that happens um, to the abomination of desolation. I don't know when it will happen, but when I hear wars and rumors of wars, when I see this, when I see Christians being persecuted, when I see the, 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 the falling away, the apostasia in the church, I told Jesus, you're absolutely 100% right. 
I would be a fool to deny what's happening. Um, but many are snorting condoms in their, you know, in their noses and spitting them out. And what, where are we? What are we doing? If Christians can't be salt and light, society has no chance. If we as Christians see this and go, ah, don't worry about it. We're just going to go home and let this be normal. Let's go back to normality. Um, you know, we're blind. We're filled with blindness and hardness of heart. Didn't Jesus would say something? Didn't Jesus say that to the, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? You foolish one, you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had said. I think the Lord will tell us the same thing if we just think that this is just normal. This, oh, well, whatever, you know. Next. Foolish ones to believe all that the prophets had said. They said it would happen. And we're privileged enough to see it. We're also great accountable to see it and do something about it. Let Christ be known and share Christ. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for tonight. May your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a quick moment before we...